Photogeometry. It's like playing Pokemon for VFX artists. But instead of throwing a ball, you need to arm yourself with a camera and make tiny steps around an object for a bunch of minutes. In this video, I'm going to talk about the whole process of photogeometry. So, what equipment you need, how to decide for an object, how to scan it, how to turn these pictures into 3D files, and how to clean it up and make it ready for any case you need. All you really need is a PC and a camera of sorts. Anything else is free. You can use pretty much anything that takes pictures. I even tried my broken phone camera and it almost worked. Important is that your device can shoot in manual, but even your phone should be able to do that. I used my Fuji XS20. To turn the pictures into 3D assets, I used Meshroom. It's free and open source, but more on that later. The most important thing is lighting. I tried to make some scans in my small apartment, but I felt that's too much of a hustle, especially with setting up the camera and adjusting the lights, when there is a free alternative which works even better. It's called the sun. Some of you might heard of him. When he and his buddies the clouds are out, you can take very soft and not directly lit pictures, which is exactly what we want. If we scan an object which has direct sunlight on it, it will bake into the texture and look weird when we try to relight it in 3D space. You can also take pictures when it isn't cloudy. Just put your object in the shadow, but be careful while choosing. The sun might move while you take the images, so a small tree doesn't work as good because there could be sudden light shining through between the leaves. When you're looking for an object, you should keep some things in mind. First of all, it should be in the right lighting. You should easily be able to walk around it. It shouldn't be too reflective, nor too small scale like my bike. And it shouldn't move. When you found your dream object, you should set your camera first. The goal is not to take pictures that look aesthetically pleasing, but instead are easy to understand from Meshroom. Which means you want flat but sharp images, which in camera language means you want everything that makes a picture dark. So your ISO should be as low as possible, because the noise can irritate the program later and make the texture look blurry. Your shutter should be over 120, so there is no motion blur. And your aperture should be as closed as possible, so you have as much in focus. But that's the setting I mostly gave in. If you take enough pictures, an open aperture should work as well. Besides shooting in manual, you should also set your white balance to manual. If any setting shifts while you take the pictures, the program might have problems understanding your movement and your texture has different lit and colored spots. When everything is set, we can begin by looking for a point to start. From there, I hold my camera directly onto the object and walk with small steps around it. After each step, I take a picture. Once I've completed the circle, I hold the camera low and tilt it towards the object. Then I repeat the circle. After that, I hold it up and do it again. Depending on your object, you might have to do one even higher or from the bottom. After doing the circle, I like to do some close-ups. This way, it's easier for Meshroom to understand the details. Your textures will also be clearer since these images will be used to create it. So all in all, I try to capture the whole object first, to the point where I think Meshroom will understand its shape, and then I go into the details. In some cases, it's easier to take three pictures in different angles from the same spot and then make a step. You should at least make 50 images, but it can easily go up to hundreds depending on your object. When your object is so tall that you can't take pictures from the top, you can mount your camera to a tripod and hold it up. Set it to self-time mode or use a remote control to take pictures. When you feel happy with the images, say thank you to the sun and go back inside. I've been using Meshroom version 2023.3, but they've been updating it recently. You can download their 2025 version directly on their website, or download the 2023 version from SourceForge. Both work pretty much the same, but 2025 is larger in size. You can find the links to these in my description. I'm using the older version because I've been using it for a while and because I've been experiencing some crashes with the newer one. Now open Meshroom. You're doing great by the way. Okay, here we can see a few windows. This thing down here is the node tree where your pictures will walk through. 
If you click on any of the nodes, you can adjust the export settings. For example, file size, texture size, mesh resolution, yada yada. For me, it works perfectly fine as it is, because I will do the adjusting later in Blender. Just drag the pictures into the upper left field. In the corner of your image, you can see if Meshroom has figured out what camera setting you used. It does so through the metadata in your images. It's important that it knows what focal length you used. If your images don't have any metadata, you can set them manually. Now, let's save the project. Meshroom will create a folder there. In that, it will save every step it goes through. This folder can get quite large, so make sure you have enough space. Press start and watch him go. You can change from graph editor to task manager and from attributes to log, just to make it look cooler. This process takes a while. Halfway done, after the step structure from motion, it creates a point cloud, which you can use to see if Meshroom got your camera movement right. If you just got a weird mix of points and cameras, it went wrong. In that case, you can try to adjust the brightness and contrast of your images, but probably need to go out and take some more pictures of your object. When everything is green, it's done. You can now open your folder. In the folder texturing, there should be a folder which name would be good as a password. And in that should be an obj, an mtl and at least one xlr file. Let's import the obj file. You can now take a look at your scan. Usually there are some spots that aren't perfect, but no worries, we can fix them. First, let's cut everything away we don't need. To do so, summon a cube and put everything inside you would like to keep. Then use a boolean modifier on your scan. Set it to interfering and fast. Select the cube as target and hide the cube. Everything fine, then apply. Before we go on, I like to duplicate the object and hide it, just as a backup in case I mess up. In a perfect scan, we can just go on with the remeshing, but often there are some errors which we can fix. In this object, we have pretty much all of them. There are some unsmoothed surfaces, some weird bumps and dents which are often caused by two reflective spots on the object, and some missing textures because I didn't took enough images from the top. These unsmooth areas can easily and satisfyingly be solved by using the Sculpt tool Smooth. The dents can also be solved in Sculpt mode. I like to use the draw brush. Just clicking and dragging lifts the surface. If you hold Ctrl and drag, you can lower it. And if you hold Shift, you can switch to Smooth. With this method, you can go over the whole object. But make sure you frequently check your textures in shading mode. Do not use dynamic typo or remesh, it will destroy your UVs and your textures. To fix the missing textures, just select the faces and move the UVs. Meshroom might have created multiple shaders with different textures, so in case you are moving the UVs but the texture doesn't show what you see in the UV editor, the face is probably on another shader or texture. Before we go on, you should make sure your object is closed, because if it gets any open sides, like a plane instead of a cube, it could make problems later while remeshing. Just extrude some faces and fill them. Is your object nice and clean, we can start to remesh and bake the texture. In case you just want to 3D print it, skip the whole texture part, remesh it and export it as STL. The object we have now is the high poly. We want to create a low poly on which we project the textures from our high poly. So, to create a low poly, we duplicate the high poly and rename it. Let's hide the high poly for now. Go to Data and open Remesh. Here we can go two ways. Either go super low poly and bake the diffuse and normal. An example would be if you want to bake a tree to a cylinder. Or secondly, adjust the voxel size to the point where you still can see all the detail, but lose enough polygons so that your PC won't cry when you use it. In that case, we only need the diffuse, because the normal map will be created by the deformations of your mesh. So if the deformations on your high and your low poly are the same, the normal map will be empty. Let's start with the second one. It's a little easier and I use it most of the time. 
So first make sure your objects are still the same size. Go to edit mode and UV unwrap your low poly. Smart projection works fine. Delete all the textures and make a new one. Create a new image, name it diffuse something and pick a size you want your textures to be. This might depend on your cores and your object size. I usually start with 4K. Connect it to your base color. Then go to render settings and open bake. Now first select your high poly and then your low poly mesh in the viewport. In the shader editor select the diffuse image you just created. And in the baking settings set bake type to diffuse, uncheck direct and indirect, check select to active and set extrusion to 0.002, then bake. In case you are unhappy with the result, try to create a new texture with a higher resolution and bake again. Sometimes a different type of UV unwrapping helps too. When you are happy, save the image texture. Blender doesn't do that automatically. I like to create a folder where I save the image texture and my exported OBJ file. To create a normal map, just create another image texture, name it normal something and put it through a normal map into the normal input. To bake the normal, select your normal image, set bake type to normal and press bake. But make sure your faces are turned all the right way. That's it. With this method you should be able to create some good looking assets. If you still have any questions, feel free to ask them in the comments. Don't forget to thank the sun and have a good one.